All right, hello. Um, today I'm gonna, I might have to go a little bit faster because I thought it was 40 minutes, but it's only 30. But a brief history of me, um, I helped write that book. Uh, I used to work at FINRA, which uh, regulates the U.S. stock exchange, so it's um, 10 to 20 billion records per day. Then I worked for Cloudera for a while, and I worked for about 100 companies, just helping them with big data. And then now I work with Blizzard. If you're unfamiliar with Blizzard, uh, they're a game company who makes World of Warcraft, Starcraft, Hearthstone, Overwatch, Here's a Storm, and Diablo. Um, you know, they process billions of records a day, I mean hundreds of billions of records a day, with the hope of making their games better and the user experience better. Um, so what are we going to be talking about today? We're going to be talking about the boring concept today of unit testing. So I'm thankful that this many people showed up. Um, so uh, we're going to talk about why do you want to test Spark outside of your clusters, uh, how to do unit testing, the difference between the data structures, and uh, supplying data to your unit tests. So the, the first thing is, like, why would you want to be outside your cluster? The, when you're running jobs in your cluster, uh, it takes time away from your cluster. If you're on AWS, it costs money. Um, people get to see your failures. Your failures are nice there in um, whatever... Uh, uh, history server you're using. Um, and sometimes when you're doing complex logic, you don't want to have to either uh, go to like a Zeppelin or a SCP or jar file up. It just takes a lot of time. What would be better is if you could run it locally and debug through it. Uh, so, it, and the other thing we're going to, I'm going to be talking about this a lot, is what do we want to be testing? Uh, we don't want to be testing Spark. Spark is already tested. You should have a vendor that you can yell, out, yell at when Spark doesn't work. What we want to be testing is um, our logic and our, what we're trying to achieve with Spark and are we getting out what we're trying to achieve. And you'll hear me say a couple times today, there's testing the large and testing the small. Uh, so if you're not familiar with Spark and, and doing that, we can talk about it afterwards, you can come get me. But there's two problems when you're dealing with distributed systems. There's dealing with the large, dealing with the DAG, you know, reshuffling massive amounts of data, filtering data, but sometimes the point is to bring the problem to small components that are processed in individual threads. And those things can be tested independently of the big. So there's the big testing and the small testing. Okay, so what about uh, Zeppelins and you know, running experiments? We kind of talked about that. Zeppelin's great and all. Um, I feel like you don't get the feature set that you get with IDEs. If we have extra time today, I'll show you what you can do in an IDE in terms of debugging, in terms of autocomplete, in terms of all those really nice features. Um, uh, and we also talked about not using cluster resources. Uh, very quick feedback. When you're doing this with unit tests, you can test individual components very quickly, very isolated. Um, and uh, in, in terms of uh, productionization, if you are actually serious in putting this in production, you want these tests to be running nightly with your nightly builds. And if you have more than one person working on your code base, um, to not have unit tests on it is to invite disaster. So if someone else goes into your code and changes it, how do you know that they were doing what was supposed to meet your requirements and your tests before? So if you're a small shop with a single person who doesn't need to care about failure, you don't have to do unit tests. If you have more than one developer on a project, you really should be doing unit tests in local development. All right, so before we go into unit tests, I just want to show you really quick how do you run Spark in your local IDE. I've gone to some clients that didn't know you could do this. You don't actually need a cluster, you don't need Hadoop, you don't even need Spark to run Spark. You, um, I have built most applications that I've ever built before I ever stepped on site to a client's site. And even when I'm at Blizzard right now, I've just started Blizzard three weeks ago, so I don't have my production keys. So I'm doing all my development on my local box and then transferring it over to them, and it works when it gets to them. So a little trick that I do at the beginning of every single one of my Spark jobs is I write this, uh, this big block of code here. It doesn't look that great, but what it allows me to do is I pump in a variable called run local, and this I type in with, you know, in my main class. And if I run local, I set up my Spark context to be running on local threads instead of a cluster. If I don't do run local and I do Spark submit, it'll go to Yarn or Mesos or whatever your container, uh, container favorite system is. Um, but that top thing, by saying local too, I'm saying two threads are going to be running in Spark. So when I send things to my uh, uh, executors to execute, there'll be two threads that'll be able to process the threads. And the other thing this allows me to do, and 
I'll skip the demo to the end because I don't know if I have enough time. But you'll be able to put breakpoints anywhere in this code. You can put it in the driver code, or you can put it in the executor code, and you can stop it, and you can examine what's going on. That's priceless. That's really priceless when you're trying to figure out you know, what's happening at every stage in development. Any questions on this one? OK, cool. So there was a live demo. We'll save this till later. Um, uh, things to note. Um, we needed a Spark context, right? Uh, there was another thing that we did, and we'll go into it in a little bit more, is this idea of parallelization, right? What, what does that mean? And we'll go into that in a little bit. But we'll need to parallelize our uh, collections. Uh, the other thing uh, that we need to do, and if I showed you the code, you'll see it, but you'll see it later on, is we need to separate out the code from the driver setup. So when you're setting up your Spark context and all that kind of stuff, you need to separate out your actual executable code into a separate method. And that separate method will take, it could take the Spark context if it wants to, uh, or it could just take the input RDDs. But you want to separate that out because you want to unit test that separately from the code that actually initiates the Spark context, right? OK. And then um, we talked about everything is fully debuggable. So let's talk about unit testing, right? Unit testing, this is unit testing the code that I had before. If, if I had enough time to walk through it, that code I had before is doing a filtered word count. Right? So what it's doing is I have these lines of words, you know, the cat and the hat, the car is blue, and stuff like that. And I have some words up here that I'm filtering out, and I don't want to count. OK? So this line of code was in my local code that I, ran, that I showed you before. And what's happening here is this is a normal Scala setup for unit tests. I have this fun, sweet thing here, which essentially gives me that before all, before after, before each, after each kind of a functionality. But then I also have this extra thing that I'm extending. And what this does, I actually have the code on this page. What this does is using that you know, before uh, and after all functionality, and it's setting up a Spark context for me. And that Spark context is going to be used throughout all the tests in that file. So it doesn't have to restart it, restop it. And you don't have to think about starting it or stopping it. right? So you can see here in my test, I start immediately with my Spark contest, and I'm broadcasting a variable. And I use this parallelize function on this collection. So that change changes this array to an RDD. Does that make sense? And we'll go into data structures in a little bit. And then once I have this broadcast variable and this RDD, everything below here is as, what, is as it was before. right? And this function is directly what I'm trying to test for production. And you can see here, then I can take those values out, and I can run normal JUnit asserts on it. Any questions on that? All right. So from this, any batch job that you, know, you can now unit test with that. Some things that we want to make sure we have in there, we want to make sure we have the Spark core test jars in there, and we want to make sure we have the Scala test jars in our dependencies. Right? Um, there's another live demo. If I have time, I'm going to get to it. So the first thing about data structures is the difference between a collection and an RDD. So when people are unfamiliar with Spark, and I don't know how many in this room may have not used Spark a whole bunch, is collections are just like a list in Java or an array, right? Everything's in one JVM. An RDD is a collection except for the fact that it has partitions. And those partitions will be possibly, if you're running in distributed mode, those are on different machines. Uh, when we're running in local mode, they, those could be processed by different threads. But the main part of it is, is that's the main difference between the two. And like we said before, we can use this parallelized method. There's an extra parameter on the end that I don't show here, which says how many partitions we want to have. So you could put in two or four or something like that, and you can control the number of partitions. This is important. Don't ever run one partition. Because you're kind of defeating the purpose, you might as well just be running locally through you know, your local driver. You want to run a couple partitions to find out if your algorithm is sending things into the wrong direction when it's doing the partitioning. OK? All right. So methods for selecting data. All right, so this is, this is a big one. I watched last night, um, I, I'm going to say this wrong. I hope I say this right, Hilden's uh, uh, talk on this in New York in 2015, and she brought up a whole bunch of generators. I haven't used these, but they're, they, they look to be very effective. 
what I have been doing in the past is two types of things. Either I take a sample of production data, uh, so I'm running off real data, but if anyone knows if you're a tester, production data is no way adequate to prove if your code's actually doing the right thing. Because in your production data, the use, it might not cover all the use cases or behavior patterns that are available. So what I do like to do is I like to work with um, business units and ask them to provide into the GitHub, either in CSV or in Excel format, the data, right? And the data with is for the inputs and the outputs. This allows them to build their requirements and their use cases independent of the development team. And we can, as the development team, can run these tests against their data nightly to see if we're meeting the requirements of the business folks, right? So it's a good way of integrating business teams with development teams without having them to actually deal with each other, right? Um, all right, any questions on data? No questions, all right, cool. So the next uh, collection that's really important is data frames, right? So data frames are like RDDs, uh, but they're magical. <laughs> so, uh, no, they're not magical. Um, the main, it has two main things. Uh, what's contained in an RDD, you can contain anything in an RDD, right? In a data frame, we want to have a row object, okay? And a row object is essentially like an array. It just has a whole bunch of values in it, but it doesn't have a schema definition. So then the other thing a data frame needs is it needs a schema definition, okay? So um, there are two ways to make data frames that I've found. One is you can make your schema definition, or the other one is you can take your schema definition, okay? So if I wanted to make a schema definition, I would have to write all this code. So you see here, I'm making um, a row, uh, uh, I'm making a whole bunch of row objects and I'm making it into a row RDD. So it's an RDD that has rows. And then you can see here, I'm defining a whole bunch of fields and then I put all those fields in a struct type. Now that I have a schema and I have an RDD, I can now uh, register that as a table and I can interact with it with SQL. Does that make sense to everybody? All right, cool. Now, what happens if you're lazy? Or what happens if the table already exists? Well, we can steal it. All we have to do is write a real simple SQL statement that says select star from trans limit zero, and we get back no data, but we get a data frame that has a schema. So we can take that schema down here and get the same result as above. This is really helpful if your tables are changing or if, you wanna, or if you're lazy and you don't want to write code, right? All right, important notes. Oh, we talked about this, bringing the small to little, little to big. So before I go on to the data frame talk, let me just bring up one thing that I had once with a customer. I went in there and I looked at their Spark job and their Spark job had something, I want to say it's had something like 50 or 60 stages in their DAG. And the Spark code was like a thousand lines long. And I looked at that and I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> and they sat down, they said, we're doing this really complicated thing. We're doing these window algorithms of people who bought houses and we want to look at uh, you know, the time, t a whole bunch of different comparatives of time of how they paid their loan and how that affected their credit statement and when they did a refinance and all that kind of stuff. And I was like, well, how many events are for a single person? And they were like, well, it'll never get over like a thousand, right? And I was, I was like, why don't we do this? Why don't we delete all the Spark code you just wrote? And we'll just do a group by, and you'll have all thousand objects right there, and then you'll just run your Scala code on that. And it ended up being, I think it was something like 20 times faster and much easier to do. So as we're going through all this unit testing of Spark, it's all great and all, but if you can avoid having the logic in Spark and putting this logic in something that's local, your job's probably gonna be faster and it's also gonna be easier to test. All right, did I just do that on the wrong one? I did do that on the wrong one, sorry about that. All right, so this is how we're going to test, um, this is how we're going to test our data frames, right? So here we go in a test, did I, did I do this right? Yes but I left out, shoot. There's a class up here that we extend. I'll get it in one minute. But there's a class up there we extend that essentially does the same thing as before where it gave me the Spark context for free. This gives me the SQL context for free. And uh, here you go. I'm just setting up. I'm making a whole bunch of rows. Uh, 
I'm making the schema as before. I'm setting it as a table. I can run this function, which essentially runs a SQL function, and I get these results. Now, the important thing is here is, are we testing Spark SQL? And the answer should be no. We're not testing Spark SQL per se. The two reasons to unit test Spark SQL that I can imagine is one is if you have a monster SQL, right? Has anybody here have a SQL over 500 lines? Come on, don't lie. They exist. I've seen them. All right. So one reason is because that's a complicated thing, right? So you might want to unit test that just because once SQL gets over like 100 lines or so, it starts becoming very difficult to really understand everything it's doing. Um, I always tell people, if you can think of the answer in SQL in less than 30 seconds, it's probably a really good problem for SQL. If it takes you more than 30 seconds to envision what the SQL statement is, SQL might not be the right answer for you. Um, but anyway, so the other reason, though, is, and I ran into this as I went to Blizzard, is I wrote a custom data source. Does everybody know what a, I mean, a default source. Does everybody know what a default source is or base relation? So the way Spark SQL works, right, is you write all this fancy SQL. Uh, then there's Catalyst, but before Catalyst, there's this connection mechanism, which is like a base relation or a default source, which communicates with the storage layer. So you, there was a talk here earlier about MongoDB. Uh, Cassandra has one. I wrote the HBase one. And what it does is it takes information from the SQL and tries to figure out how to most efficiently grab that data from the storage layer. So I had to write my own. And unit testing this through SQL was very beneficial to me. So I could see the entire pipe all the way from the SQL down to what my storage layer was. Make sense? All right. Any questions on that? All right, I might actually have some time for some demos. All right. Uh, if you're testing Hive, so one of the things that people don't know is if you're using the Hive context, anybody here use the Hive context? It will actually make like a Hive Metastore for you locally, which is really convenient. Again, you don't need a cluster. You don't need anything like that. You need to be careful that you don't spin up more than one because it'll blow up. Uh, I actually ran into a problem where um, I found someone spinning up a lot of Hive uh, context, and they ran into a lot of trouble. Um, it allows you to do a lot of neat things inside of your testing, like creating, deleting, rewriting. I've actually found a good deal of bugs with the Hive context, especially with altering and changing table names. You know when you're like swapping out tables and stuff like that? Spark is great, but it's not perfect, and sometimes things don't work, and the rename didn't actually work. Uh, so testing out that uh, what your logic is doing in changing Hive metadata is a valid thing, I think, to test. Um, let's see. Oh, when you're doing this, make sure you pick the location of your tables. So if you're making tables in this situation, if you don't set a location, it's going to go to user, Hive, whatever, you know, um, on your computer, and it may not have permissions to write to that, right? So it's a good... It's a good um, practice to set the directories local to your unit tests so the Hive tables get created somewhere in there and that you can clean them up. You don't want the Hive tables to be created somewhere randomly on your um, job creation machine. Um, oh, yeah, and feel free to delete all the tables in Metastore when you're done. They just get recreated on the next job. All right, and now for streaming. Uh, streaming is like data frames, but more. Uh, so what is a... So streaming runs off these things called a DStream. And a DStream is, so if this is an RDD and it has three partitions, uh, a DStream is almost like a film strip of RDDs. So the way I like to explain it, you remember those really old, like really old, I might be showing my age, but back when I was in elementary school, they had these projectors that had these little wheels and it would spin off one and it would go into the other one and it would, the film would literally go over this light source, right? So that's like a D stream. The RDD that you're focusing on is the frame in front of the light. But a D stream actually has all the RDDs from every interval. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, cool. So how do we make one of these? So there's a nice little class called Test Suite uh, that comes with the Spark Streaming test jar. And what it will give us is this really cool operation. I was blown away when I found this. So it's called test operation, right? And what you do is you put in a whole bunch of sequences for your input and a whole bunch of outputs for your output. 
And what's it's going to do? It's going to create an RED from each one of those sequences. And this sequence is going to be the first interval, and this is going to be the output expected for the first interval. So it's doing all of that creation of that DStream and all the complexity of feeding that to Spark Streaming for you for free. And then all you need to supply is the actual function, right? And again, I've splitted this out so we can test it independently. Does that make sense? So I was blown away by this, how simple this is. So again, if you're doing Spark Streaming, a lot of things can happen wrong in streaming and stuff like that. If you're not putting it through unit tests, especially when it's this simple, you're only hurting yourself. Um, now, there is um, you know, MLlib and GraphX. Everything we've talked about so far should also apply to them. What's the big difference? Their RDDs, like data frames, are a little bit specific, right? Um, with, with, um, with MLlib, you have you know, vectors and uh, labeled points and stuff like that. And with graphs, you have edges and vertexes, right? So you will be able to test all of these mechanisms with everything we've talked about so, so far. Uh, the other thing is, how do you test integration with external systems? So I have some experience with this because I've at Cloudera, I did, I wrote the HBase uh, uh, SQL connector and other connectors, and I worked with HDFS a lot. So all of these have mechanisms to work off your local machine. So HBase has a mini cluster. You start up a mini cluster, it gives you a connection object that you can send. You can interact with that mini cluster as if it's HBase, and you can validate if it's doing the right thing. HDFS, when you make a file system object, if it recognizes that there's no HDFS there, it will use the local file system, right? But again, it's the same APIs, it's the same behaviors. Um, the same goes with Kafka, the same goes with Cassandra. And you would think this is obvious because these systems need something to unit test off anyways, right? So um, if you are in need for details on how to do this, what I would do is look into the Spark integration code of that uh, storage system with, with Spark. So with HBase, it would be the HBase Spark module. Uh, I don't know what the other ones are for the other ones, but you can go in and look at their unit tests and steal the way that they do their uh, mini servers. All right. So I'm going to have three minutes of demo time. Uh, so OK. So um, now. Running in distributed mode, you will not find everything. There will be skew. There will be some slight differences in the code that runs in a distributed fashion. There will be things like uh, node failures and stuff like that that just happen in the wild. So there's many ways to go about this. I didn't know about this uh, Yarn and Mesos approach that um, was brought up in that other talk. So, uh, but I have used these. Mainly, this is what a development environment is for. Uh, you should have your nightly job spinning something off to your uh, development environment. The reason why I like the development environment is it's because a lot of the issues will be things like the version that's in your cluster versus the version that's on your code, uh, or the configuration that your cluster administrators have versus what's on your code. Those are normally the issues, right? Uh, and then you can simulate those with Docker also if the same people who are configuring the Docker is the same people configuring your cluster. The whole thing is it's now the integration of the code versus the cluster's configuration. Any questions on that? All right, so we have a little bit of time. Does this six minutes include my questions, or is it? Oh, dang it. Should we do the demo? OK. All right, can you switch me over? All right, say the question while I do the demo. What's the question? It should be coming up here soon. Can we put demo machine up there? All right. OK, here's my IntelliJ. I will do this one real quick. This is my word count code. So you can see I get my RDD here, and then I call this function. This function has my filtering out and word count, right? Now, this function happens inside an RDD. So it happens, so, so I mean, this takes an RDD and then processes it, right? So that's a map function. So I'm going to put a breakpoint 
inside, oh, that's still a filter, let's do this. Let's do this so we we'll split it out a little bit. So I can put a breakpoint in here, and I can also put a breakpoint out here, right? So this is just running locally, and this is word count. So the big things that I want to show here is you can debug driver code and executable code. In the same, so now this is driver code, so I can look at everything as I would other, you know, normally. And now here I am on a split. This is the data that's coming in, and I can iterate through all the records that are coming through, right? So that's normal running your code, right? And then unit testing is, this is the same code for unit testing. You should be able to go down here and say, uh, fire it off. It'll do the exact same thing, except it'll tell you if the test was complete or not. If we want to make the test fail, just run it again. and it should fail. Yep, so, and then we get the reason, right? Just like normal unit tests. So there's, some, there's nothing that's going to be different from Spark to normal unit tests. And by the way, that's the class that I left out of the slide, shared SQL context, okay? All right, any, any questions on the demo or any questions in general? Where is it it's on my laptop. <laughs> um, I'll try to post it on my GitHub later on. Do you have any questions? Just go ahead and uh, use the mics so people can actually hear you. We've got four minutes, so you've got four minutes of his time. And I'm sure you'll be able to answer the question you have. Oh, by the way, are you, are you attaching the debugger to the port 5000 on your, on your local JVM? This is all my local JVM. Yeah, so I don't even have my uh, internet up, so this is not even the internet. OK, go ahead. Hi. Um, in one of those slides, you had um, a cert input buffer equal equal to, something like that. You, are, this? you are making sure that uh, your Spark configuration didn't change. That's how it seems, at least. On one of the slides, I had the... In the test code, you have a cert right in the beginning. Uh, I l I let me go look. I'll look uh, real quick. Can you put back his presentation? I mean, uh, it's possible. Oh, I uh, know. I was just counting the outputs. Uh, I'll show afterwards. Come to my thing and point it out. But I think I was just counting the outputs. But that's valid too to to assert any configurations that could be set up by the extended class. I was why would they change? Yeah, uh, yeah. Afterwards, come up. We'll we'll do it. Yeah, we can talk. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, um, do you have any techniques uh, to avoid the common traps? like uh, too large tasks or closure problems or um, partitioning that explodes with yes. a shuffle? Yes, so that was, that was a talk I gave six days ago in London, which is uh, the five biggest mistakes of distributed programming. This is not going to, none of this is going to protect you from skew. None of this is going to protect you from bad partitioning if you're unaware of your data set, right? And probably the data you're pulling in is not enough to really recognize SKU unless you're looking really carefully. So if SKU is your problem, uh, we can talk about it later, but the answer is salting. Uh, I was talking about uh, more uh, the code logic, like uh, you, you have a bad, you, you miss um, ray partitioning or something like this and the partitions explode. Or... So this will help you make sure that things are partitioned correctly. This won't necessarily, unless you're really careful, help you know if you're getting the right distribution yeah. and stuff like that. You can by essentially, if you had a sample set of real data and then you did a count of the amount of records in each partition, that's a way. But now you have to constantly yeah. say, I'm going to be testing for SKU. Um, but if SKU is a concern of yours, salting is the answer, and I can walk you through that afterwards. Essentially, you just put a little dirt on the end of the queue I mean, at the end of the key, and then after the initial reduce by key, you reduce one more time. Okay, we can alternate between the mics so that way everybody gets a chance. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Um, so uh, if you use the method that you showed uh, with the shared Spark context, um, I have the feeling that uh, when your code base, code base grows, that uh, the tests sort of uh, like are not fast enough to like really be unit tests. So what I have done is. Uh, 
created a sort of thin wrapper around the RDD API to, uh, in my unit tests, uh, inject uh, a local uh, collection and in my uh, integration tests or in my production code to actually create the, uh, the RDD. Uh, is that something that you have considered as well? So or? remember when I was talking about the big and the small? Mm -hmm. So uh, think about like a map partition. It returns to you an iterator, right? Yeah. If you want to test a function that runs off that iterator, you don't need a Spark context, right? The Spark context is only there to help you with things with like dealing with what would be the outcome when your data is a little partitioned. You know, is it partitioning well and then hitting the method correctly? That's really where it's coming. If you can test the logic without the whole infrastructure, then that's a positive thing, and you want to aim for that. You don't always have to test the big to test the small. That's, I think that's what you're doing, essentially. Yeah, but uh, if you then have a, a, like operations which are, uh, depend on the previous step of the, on, the, on the RDD, then... You... And that's where, that's where having the Spark context can be valuable, but also remember there should be, the right way of saying it, contracts between the different stages, so you can test the individual stages, so as long as stage one ad adheres to what it's supposed to be doing, stage two can assume that it got the data in a certain way. But that's all dependent upon how you want to do it. But yes, if you use the Spark context, you can do the entirety in one shot. Okay, I'm afraid we're out of, uh, out of time, so we can Ted, catch Ted around the corner if you actually want to ask more questions. Thanks a lot. Give a big hand to Ted, please.